Uh, there was a tweet about, is the whole thing going to be in uh, Old or Middle English? I do have an interest in language, but I'm not going to do the Shakespeare thing. That's a different talk. Um, however, because it's language, we are going to ask this question. Uh, this is a question, what do you mean? Or more often. Because um, <laughs> it turns out that this is one of the fundamental things that we focus on, sometimes without realizing it. If you're building software, this is what you do. It is the construction and discovery of an organization of meaning. So there's going to be a few literary references. I thought, OK, we won't, we won't go all the way back, but I'm going to go back to Robert Louis Stevenson, author of uh, Treasure Island, um, and uh, the uh, strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, so Scottish author making this observation, the difficulty of literature is not to write, but to write what you mean, not to affect your reader, but to affect him precisely as you wish. Now this is really interesting because it turns out there's, this is a bit of a twofer. There are two aspects here. First of all, you have to get this thing out and then you have to influence somebody else. I mean, that's, that's, normally, that's normally one more thing than most people can manage. Two more things than many developers can manage. So, uh, this is a really interesting challenge. The, the construction, this, this discovery from within, and this projection into somebody else's mind. So, when we come to software, we get when it comes to meaning. This is a really good definition from uh, Manny Meyer Lehman. Um, from a paper in 1980, and there's a lot of really good stuff in this paper, but one of the things I absolutely adore is this sentence, which I think he had great fun constructing. There in the middle of this very academic paper, you get this, any program is a model of a model within a theory of a model of an abstraction of some portion of the world or of some universe of discourse. Now, this means next time somebody says, so tell me, what do you do? You, you could just drop this one in there conveniently. So tell me about, you know, this, the programs and applications, what is it, what are, they, what are they? Well, just roll this one out. And either you will find yourself in a deeply engaged conversation or you will have terminated a conversation that wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, this is my gift to you. Um, but he mentions abstraction. And abstraction is about removal. And this is kind of an interesting thing. People often forget that's what it means. We use in software development the term abstraction so often, and to abstract, we use, talk about abstract data types, abstract classes. We use levels of abstraction. And we forget that actually abstraction is about removal. And why do we remove? How do we distinguish a good abstraction from a poor abstraction? A good abstraction is one where you remove the stuff you don't need, and therefore you leave the stuff that you need, the stuff that you actually want that conveys your meaning. A poor abstraction, therefore, is going to be one of two things. Either you remove the stuff you needed, or you leave in the stuff you don't need. Yeah, that's, that gives you noise. So this is a really interesting observation from Dijkstra. Um, and I mean, there's a certain irony there. He talks about the humble programmer. Dijkstra, Dijkstra was not a humble man. Somebody once mentioned um, ego is measured in nano Dijkstras. Um, <laughs> so we've got a really interesting observation here. The purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. Sometimes people equate abstraction with exactly this vagueness. That's because it's done poorly. But this idea of meaning, Meaning is not a fixed thing. In fact, we go back to Mr. Stevenson. He wrote this as part of an essay called Truth of Intercourse. Now, there's a word that's changed since the 19th century. <laughs> so therefore, meaning is not the truth of that phrasing has changed. And we see this is actually an important thing, because it turns out that meaning is a function of many things, a function of the people, the context, and the time. And then people kind of say, oh, yeah, but Kevin, that's just semantics. And in fact, You've probably said this at some point, or if not, you've probably been in a conversation or a discussion where somebody has dismissed something, and it's a dismissal. Oh, that's just semantics. And it's just like, pause for a moment. If you're not sure, go and look it up in the dictionary. It's just meaning. <laughs> now, that's kind of big. That's a huge thing. There is nothing else. What, what exactly are you doing? You are phrasing meaning. So when we talk about software, Software 
is a system of meaning, both from the user's point of view. What you're trying to do from, for the user is you're trying to create something that allows them to work within a particular world. You give them things that mean something to them, and they use this as an extension of their thinking, if it's a good application. On the inside of the code, it's exactly the same story. You've got a choice. There is, there is a relevance to all of this fiction, all these fiction references. You have a choice about how you construct something. It is a fiction, it is arbitrary, it doesn't have to be that way. You could choose a different programming language, a different programming style. You have a number of choices, but you are making these choices either arbitrarily or because you have some concept that you are, guess what, trying to place in somebody else's head. When you are choosing the name for something, names are not just labels, they are showing you boundaries. They're making people think, oh, I see what you mean. Quite literally, you're trying to take a model and put it into somebody else's head. That's non-trivial, it turns out. So how do we do it? We do it with code. Okay, now there's an interesting thing here, is that just to clarify, when people talk about code, the term code for a lot of developers is whatever is my, pro my favorite programming language, whatever is my dominant programming language. So you get a Java programmer and they'll go, oh, I am a Java programmer. What about all that XML? Oh, that's not my program, but it holds the whole thing together. What about all that JSON? Oh, that's not my program either, but it configures everything and it is the data. It's kind of the blood in the stream of your code. And what about all those little, bit, those little scripts that you've written in Groovy around the edges? Oh, that's not my code. That's just something else. And all these things get second classed and they are code. They are all quite literally code. All this stuff, the tests, the scripts, the configuration files, they're all code. They're not something else. They are code. They might just not happen to be in the center of your focus of attention, your certification, whatever it is. I am certified in curly brackets for configuration. Nobody, people don't offer certification in that. You, you get enterprise level something else. But enterprise level, I can match angle brackets, does not exist. So there is a notion here of this stuff. And people have their preferences. I mean, honestly, I, occasionally I run into somebody who likes XML. Um, you know, and I, I, this is out in the street, not in some place where it's safe with padded walls. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, the point there is that these are all code. And we can do a little bit of word play here. Codified knowledge. If you think about it for a moment, that's what your code base is. There are lots of different ways of looking at code. So it's not really a product, but it is definitely a thing. And what is it? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a codification of what you believe you are building and how you are building it. It's a, it's a codified agreement. It's, it's an act of a group, a team of people saying, okay, here's how we're thinking about this. This is our understanding of the technology, the domain and the relationships that we need to work around with, and any deficits and shortcomings in the technology. And this is your, it's a negotiation. This is quite interesting. It is what you know. Whenever I tell teams this, they kind of look a little downcast in many cases. They go, oh, what, this is a representation of our knowledge? Good grief, it's a mess. You know, <laughs> this is what we know. And the problem we, we come to is when you start thinking about it, you end up with, well, this is what we, in a, in, a, in a poor code base, what you end up with is this is what we thought today, this is what we thought a month ago, and it's right side by side with half a dozen thoughts from people that are no longer here, um, and ancient civilizations from 10 years ago who laid down the initial plinth of this legacy, and we don't know what they were thinking. But there's this idea, this is the knowledge, this is, this is what you're accumulating. So therefore, by definition, that means that software development itself is a process of knowledge acquisition. And this is kind of interesting, it has implications for understanding how do you develop a software system? In other words, things like software development life cycles. Knowledge acquisition does not look like building things with bricks. Knowledge acquisition is it's a little bit messier. Knowledge acquisition is revisionist. You revise, you re-understand what you already knew. You say, oh, now I understand what we've been trying to build. Your knowledge breaks through, it reforms itself. So it's revisionist and it's iterative, it revisits and then it builds. So it's cumulative, but it's, it's not necessarily tidy. And most importantly, the implication here is you're always working with incomplete knowledge. You do not know everything. I know there's, I've met a couple of developers who think that they're the exception, but they're not the exception. 
Now this is interesting because if you're acquiring knowledge, oh yeah, feel free by the way to use this phrasing if you are trying to explain this to somebody else, preferably a higher up. You know, it's, oh yes, we're using a knowledge acquisition to create a system of meaning for a model within a model, et cetera, et cetera. You know? <laughs> what you're actually doing is there's a much simpler word. We're learning. Learning, that's what learning looks like. In other words, what you're trying to do is collective learning, not just individual learning. As a team, we're trying to learn how, and by the way, the, the target keeps moving. Damn them. As we discovered, language moves. So what if language moves, why doesn't everything else? Of course it does. And markets tend to move, well, I was gonna say markets move faster than language, but I have two teenage boys. I think markets move about the same speed as language. Language is quite feisty and fast. Um, but that's exactly it. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to have this ongoing dialogue. And as it were, here are my notes. But they're not like my notes were when I studied. They're legible. Well, we're hoping they're legible. And here, you know, it's got good style and they're collective notes. It's almost like a, um, uh, an executable Wikipedia. Okay, in other words, that's a collaborative exercise in creating something. And that's quite interesting because if you're gonna do that, it means you need to communicate, which goes right back to this whole thing of like, yes, I need to put an idea into somebody else's head. Now, in the absence of telepathy, that means you're gonna to have to pay attention to things. Honestly though, I do wonder, people always talk about telepathy, if, if humans had telepathy, I think civilization would be over in about five, maybe 10 minutes at the most. Um, you really don't want to know what everybody else is thinking. So communication is this idea of how do I convey this concept, this meaning, my interpretation of what's going on. It also tells us, so I mentioned this idea of negotiation, it also tells us that your code base is a matter of social negotiation. It's not a rational endeavor. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I don't know if the sound is catching this, but there's a sound of a baby in the background. Uh, the, one of the youngest developers we've got here, possibly even the best, we don't know. Um, and there's a wonderful thing, when you look at children, you see the raw version of a human being. And adults wander around thinking like, yeah, I'm totally rational and like competent and educated in the world and yeah, yeah. No, honestly, kids, they are the raw versions. All we do as adults is we learn to dress it up a little bit better. But the, all those emotions, all of that randomness and that irrationality, but also the, the ability to have insights, those are all there. And we just try and marshal them a little bit. And so there's this negotiation, how to get along with others. That's a lot of what coding guidelines are about. And in fact, it also tells us a little bit about what a software architecture is. When we use the software architecture metaphor, we are normally thinking about things in a structural sense. We are normally thinking about arrangements, things that depend on other things. We are structuring in terms of spaces and the meaning of those spaces. But there's something else going on here as well. An architecture, just like in a building, is a model of participation. A good architect doesn't simply just say, well, yes, we need to remember the load-bearing uh, structures, and this is an office building, therefore, you know, it's gonna have some kind of square meterage that we're gonna sell for this amount of money, and all that. There's more to it than that. It's how do you want people to work within the space, to flow within the space? Yeah, and there's an idea that a well-designed building, well-designed space, tells you how people are going to interact. Exactly the same with code. It's a model of participation, which gives us a very different insight into software architecture, which is normally a cold kind of topic. It's actually a little more human. Now, that gives us this idea. And software architecture, therefore, tells us we care about design. Now, design is a funny word because um, design, uh, people often wonder, is, you know, as, as a word, where does it come from? Um, I, speak, I speak Portuguese and it's, it's kind of interesting that in Portuguese there's no difference between the word for drawing and the word for design, desenho. It's, it's, it's the same and that is actually historically um, uh, it's, it's Latinate origin. Um, it's, it's an arrangement of things. Um, and you're doing so with the purpose of communicating. People use designs as an act of communication. But when we think about designing code, there are two sides to it. We spend a lot of, there's, there's the synthesis side which is the putting things together. And then there's the analysis side, which is the taking things apart. And both of these, both of these are kind of essential. But what I find interesting is that people have spent a lot of time trying to order these. Let's understand what we're gonna try and build, and let's go and build it. Okay, there's kind of a logic to that. 
But it's not really, it doesn't quite work, because it turns out that humans don't work like that. We work with incomplete knowledge. It turns out that one pass is not enough. Uh, I think one of the most insightful moments I had uh, was doing um, some tutoring. Uh, ooh, I don't know, it was about a quarter of a century ago. Um, and I was uh, tutoring somebody who was doing a diploma. And she wanted to know why she had scored so poorly on a particular essay, a particular question. And it was asking about the waterfall development life cycle. And so I read her answer. And it said, OK, so first of all, we, we, write the, we write the code. That's the first step. We write the code. Then we analyze why it all went wrong. And then we design it properly. <laughs> and I said, I understand, why, I understand why the lecturer didn't give you many marks for this. But at the same time, you've hit on a deep and profound truth. <laughs> You know, so I, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. This, this is you've you've hit the advanced level already. You know, it's, uh, but it turns out really that 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 insight, that insight, tells us that this ordering is a challenging thing. It also tells us that we don't get things right. That we are working with insufficient knowledge. That learning is not a linear thing. Learning is filled with loads of missteps. And that we need to think of, as things change with time, what are the things that change with time successfully? It turns out living creatures do. So perhaps we need to look to life. And it turns out that the relationship that you want when you're thinking about the taking apart and putting it together is systole, diastole. Systole is the contraction of your heart. The muscles contract. They, they push out the blood. And then diastole, there's relaxation. The chambers refill and repeat. About a billion times. That's about two billion times for a human being. But it turns out, and I don't know if this is a piece of trivia that will ever come in handy, but it's one of those things that I seem to have remembered. Um, pretty much every creature that has a heart, it's, it's good for about a billion beats. Okay? Um, mice have shorter lifetimes because their hearts beat really quickly. And uh, the Galapagos tortoise kind of has a really slow heartbeat, kind of lasts a bit longer. Um, so it turns out around a billion. So if anybody ever asks you that fact after you've deterred that person away by having told them exactly what it is that you do with respect to a model within a model and process of abstraction, etc., you're looking for a conversation, starter or stopper, either one, then that billion could be useful. But this is how we need to think. This is how we need to think of this idea of establishing the meaning and building something. It's, there's breathing in, there's breathing out. There's going back and seeing, oh, that's what we mean. Hemingway observed the only kind of writing is rewriting. And there's a kind of an insight here which is quite helpful. There's a, a book by Robert McKee on, um, uh, uh, on screenplays and screenwriting. It's called Story. And, uh, uh, there's some interesting stuff in here. Uh, it's uh, in a couple of places it'll formulate. Don't necessarily agree with everything you said, but there's some really interesting analyses and additional insights and terminology. There's this lovely quote. If a plot works out exactly as you first planned, you're not working loosely enough. Not working loosely enough to give room to your imagination and instincts. I think this is a lovely way of looking at things because <clears throat> Often, and I, I actually write short fiction as a hobby, there is that notion, you sit down and go, right, I've got the story in my head. People sit down, I've got the code in my head. You know, I've got the system in my head. I, I, we, yeah, we, this is how it's going to be. And there's a little part of, you know, and often it doesn't work out that way, but there's a little part of me that also wants to challenge the fact that, what if it did work out exactly as you planned? There's a little part of me that would actually be disappointed because it would suggest I learned nothing. It would suggest that there was nothing new here. There was no new knowledge to be obtained. And that, you know, this is a, that we, we, we know everything already. And the whole point of software is that software is normally the creation of something that doesn't exist. Okay, that's, I'm not saying you have to, just, just to clarify, I'm not saying that you need to go out and build another JavaScript framework from the ground up. That's just, you know, th th there's somebody doing that right now. Okay, and they're possibly even in this room on their phone, but just, just don't, that's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that with that stuff that already exists, you can make something that is different because software is normally the production of variation. It's not the production of identical things. If you, want to, if you want something that's identical, you go and say, I'll have the thing that already exists. That's manufacturing. We, that's a solved problem. Software is normally, I want something like that, but different in this way. 
is you're producing something that typically does not exist in the world in that way. So there's this idea that we're inviting people, when we talk about design, we're not saying something cold, we're saying something actually quite exciting. This is creative work. And the idea is you don't know everything, and so there is this space. So it also tells us, and let's go and borrow from the writing world again. Now, one of the things I like, I, I'm very interested in language, and I run a, a, a page on uh, Facebook called Word Friday. Um, and uh, as a, uh, by the way, one of my other hobbies is that, one of my other hobbies in addition to that is taking pictures of books. I tell you what, books are a lot easier than people. <laughs> Yeah, they never, they, kind of, they never close their eyes at the wrong moment and you know, they never have the wrong expression. Um, you know, they never go through the shy teenager or the showy off teenager kind of approach. Uh, it, books just sit there. What you could do is organize the lighting, that's it. Um, but I normally examine language stuff and every Friday, well, most Fridays, I put up a word that is unusual um, and its definition. And here's one from the writing community, pantser. We'll, we'll hear more about pants later. Um, pantser. This is a lovely word because it's a writer who writes by the seat of their pants. <laughs> and th this is wonderfully captured by the um, American author Louis Lemoore. Uh, he said, one day my daughter came up to me and she asked me why I was typing so fast. I said, because I want to find out what happens. <laughs> And there is a truth to that, because this is the whole point. Software is all about the details. As you are building the software, it's not some grand, it's not, it's not, it's not all worked out just because you, you, know, you put up a design idea, but you haven't worked out all the detail. That is a suggestion, that's a direction. That's going, let's go, left, left, let's go that way and see what's happening. And as it reveals, you find there's more and more detail. Some of that detail is not just detail to do with some framework. It is often a detail to do with the domain and what does somebody want? What you've done is you've pushed the world to the point where you have to commit to something. And it's not a hand-waving effect. What does happen in this particular edge case? That's a real question. It's not a question about the programming language. It's just the programming language has pushed you to a formalism that doesn't let you wave your hands and go, oh, you know what I mean. That's the whole point. We don't know what we mean. Or rather, the danger is you do think you know what you mean. And it turns out the other person also thinks they know what they mean. And it turns out it's different. This is the challenge. Now, what we're doing here is we're describing a spectrum. In contrast to a plotter, a pantser doesn't work to or have an outline. So this is not a binary thing. This tells us a spectrum, and it applies just as well uh, to software development. You know, uh, plotting versus pantsing. Plotter works out every scene in detail, and they, they, they move their characters around like marionettes. Whereas a pantser's going like, ah, let's just see where, where it goes, okay? And that's not the end of the story, quite literally, because writing is rewriting. The point is sometimes you're just laying out these things and you go back over and say, well, that was crap, but this is good. Let's explore this avenue. And in other words, what you're doing is you're generating stuff, ideas. Now, let's, as I said, let's go back to this word pants, because here is an interesting one about meaning and context. Because that really only works, flying by the seat of your pants relies, that is a phrasing that is American. It turns out that when one refers to pants in certain other contexts, in the UK, you're not going to get away with the same interpretation, uh, which causes much amusement. But not as and, but if we're talking about pants, honestly, we're going to have a word about thongs. <laughs> okay, you, are, you Australians are way too fresh. Um, it's just like, you know, the weather's going to be good, bring your thongs. It's like, shit, will a mankini do? I don't know. Um, so here's a point. You can have an established set of symbols and yet have completely different interpretations. And it turns out that this is as true in code as it is in the real world. But in code, we have the illusion sometimes that we know what we're doing. Yeah? So this gives us the problem of language. Now, we have programming language, we have natural language, and uh, that is one of those challenges that you're straddling two worlds. When you're developing software, you've got this kind of like fluid world of possibilities and certain ambiguities. And you've got this other world that's actually quite crisp. It's not really filled with ambiguity. The ambiguity comes from the reader. It doesn't mean you can't get something wrong though. And that's the point that we are constantly bridging these two worlds. That's the challenge is that these two domains have very different behaviors. So 
This was um, a, a really good uh, piece from uh, Keith Braithwaite um, in uh, this book I put together a few years ago, 97 Things Every Program Should Know. And he talks about read the humanities. And he referred to Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, later era rather than earlier era of Wittgenstein. He says, Wittgenstein makes a very good case that any language we use to speak to one another is not and cannot be a serialization format for getting a thought or idea or picture out of one person's head and into another. And sometimes we have this very idealized, positivist view that the requirements as written down in linear form, that's exactly what it is. And then if we talk through it, then that'll be enough. It's just that, no, 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 no. Just, that can be part, that can be one of the communication channels, but that's not the whole story. You're, gonna, the, you're leaving out a ridiculous amount uh, of tacit assumption um, and genuine world building. But the way that people form their experience, referring back to the baby earlier on, is, is not through this. Wittgenstein also shows that our ability to understand one another at all does not arise from shared definitions, it arises from shared experience, from a form of life. In other words, where you have shared experience, then that allows you to go, oh yeah, that thing. It's the shared, that's how language arises. And that's again when you're talking about code. It's exactly the same thing. There's a shared experience going on there, but we forgot that we once upon a time were children and that we had to have this establishment of these things. This may be one reason why programmers who are steeped in their problem domain tend to be better than those who stand apart from it. And that's really interesting because we often talk about separations and perspectives and disciplines, and there's this idea we can understand that by standing outside it. Well, you can get a point of view, but you also need the other point of view, which is what's it like from the middle? And it turns out that the domain looks very different from the inside. And uh, I saw a talk recently, um, uh, from somebody who was actually a business, people often refer to the business in the abstract and business people and they kind of guess what they want and, you know, and, and it turns out she said, I've come from the business. Oh, the way, you, the way you people use terminology, it's so funny, especially when you're talking about us and you think you're talking our language. Um, it's, uh, yeah, she started laughing at that point. Um, you know, so it's a case of like, okay, so we're clearly missing a few things here. It does turn out there's quite a gap. So. Obviously, we're going to try and bridge this gap. But we're, we're presented with this other challenge. Nate Jackson observed this one. Your customers do not mean what they say. And as he says, I've never met a customer yet that wasn't all too happy to tell me what they wanted. Usually in great detail. The problem is that customers don't always tell you the whole truth. Now, the observation here is not that they lie. They generally don't. But they use their terms, their contexts. How do you find out somebody else's context? You, I, hi, I'm Kevin, this is my context, and I pull it out of a car. That does, that's not how it works. That's not how people work. People kind of drag, they walk around in this kind of like haze of their context, and you can't quite tell what it is. They leave out significant details. Oh, the stuff that's not said, wow, that's really hard. It turns out that most communication is, is through omission. That's insane. What, by leaving stuff out and communicating things? It's like, how does that work? But also, they make assumptions. And this is an interesting one, because how do you know you have an assumption? And assumptions are funny little things. You know you have an assumption usually when it is contradicted. Until that moment, you were not aware you had an assumption. And then somebody says something, somebody shows you something, and you go, oh, I had assumed that. And in that moment, you have discovered you have an assumption. So assumptions are generally retrospective. So I, I kind of always like seeing things, and uh, so I remember seeing this at one client's, as a list of project assumptions, in a kind of, in a document, right near the beginning, and it's just, oh, my sweet, my sweet summer child. <laughs> it's just like, you can't do this. You don't know what your assumptions are. The best you can do is list of assumptions so far. Dot, 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 to be continued. Put a little bit of drama or excitement in there. Make people come back for the next version of the document. Okay, because that's the best you're gonna do. It's like, oh, we discovered another assumption. Yeah, that's the point. You only discover in contradiction. That's really difficult, because a customer's not gonna know, that. you're not gonna know that. This is compounded by the fact that many customers don't actually know what they want in the first place. And this is where it gets interesting, because you get a lot of developers going like, oh yeah, customers, they have no idea. And this is, this is the bad news moment, or the moment of great revelation of the evening. It turns out that it's not unique to those people we call customers. 
It's to do with being human. It's a human property. And also another great revelation of this century. Um, we weren't aware of this at the end of the 20th century, but this century we have established that software developers are human. So we're actually, we're the same species. We are actually the same species. Who knew? This is an utter shock. But it also turns out that all our cognitive biases and frailties, yeah, we get those as well. Yeah, people often hear about cognitive biases and say, oh yeah, I've seen people with these. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every day in the mirror. And by the way, the belief that other people have biases and you don't is also a bias. It's called the fault. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's a cognitive blind spot. Uh, it's a, so, uh, it's the bias blind spot, I think, is the formal name. So there is this notion that it's a human trait. Um, so it's very difficult to articulate because people don't generally wander around with prioritized lists in their head. Okay? Yeah, that's, yeah, I would like a prioritized list of, of, of your requirements. You say, yeah, that's great because that's exactly how I think. Not at all. That's not how it works. Um, pick something that you really love, a topic or a domain or something like that. I used to do this. Um, my wife and I used to do this kind of like end of week debrief. Um, that's a fancy way of saying we go to the pub on a Friday. Um, uh, but you know, it was just like, okay, we've had the week, sometimes I've been away, and it's just like, right, let's just go to the pub. And, and one of the ones my wife used to always spring on me, she said, okay, Kevin, tell me your top five films, or your top five albums, or whatever. And I'd, I'd, I'd sit there and cry, that's totally unfair, I can't do that. You know, that's totally unreasonable. What about 10? And she said, OK, I'll give you 10. And I want them in order, as that's completely unreasonable. And then I give her 12 completely out of order. And as the evening went on, I'd change my mind. Because that's how the brain works. It is associative, um, and it is contextual. And whatever you saw recently or discussed recently, that goes to the front. This idea that people walk around with, hey, I've got prioritized list in my head, and it's stable and meaningful. Oh. No, that's not how we work. We're human. So this also tells you that the revisionism is actually comes from within us as well. But going back to the idea of learning, this all forms part of a greater cycle. As Neil Gaiman observed, you have to finish things. That's what you learn from. You learn by finishing things, which is why there is an attraction to software development life cycles and software development practices that move us in steps where we're able to say, and breathe, and look at what we did. OK? Yeah, that worked out. Oh, no, that didn't work out. I wonder why it didn't work out. In other words, they're all about this. Once you feel you've reached some point of completion, even trivial, when you think, ah, OK, now I can look at it with a little bit more object objectivity and understand it. And yeah, I think I've learned something from that. Maybe I won't do it that way again. Uh, or I see where this is taking us. Yes, I understand what to do next. That's the whole point. You need that little bit of slowing down. We're always in a hurry. It's just like you've got to breathe. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, yeah, 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 but you know, we've, we're always told you've got to plan these things, or the tyranny of engineering and software engineering tells us that we need to plan things up front and all the rest of it. Oh, let's examine that. There's a lot of half-truths kicking around the industry. In fact, half-truths are they good, honestly. I think sometimes we fail to even hit the 50% mark on truth. Um, so uh, software engineering, this is the... Um, uh, these are the proceedings of the NATO-sponsored Software Engineering Conference in Garmisch, 1968. This was a landmark conference, massively influential. Not always for the right reasons, um, because a lot of people didn't actually read the original proceedings, it turns out. Uh, I did this a couple of years ago. Um, I was fascinated by what I found in there. Um, a lot of people refer to this as being the point where software engineering was created, the way the term was created, well, first of all, that's false. The term software engineering predates 1968 by a few years. And we can currently credit Margaret Hamilton, um, uh, who was at MIT and was uh, responsible for one of the teams that dealt with the Apollo guidance software um, for coming up with this term. Uh, we can also credit her team with uh, the fact that there was a moon landing at all, uh, the 1202 era for the geeks amongst, the uber space geeks amongst you. Um, all of this stuff came down because when she asked certain questions, like, what happens if this gets overloaded in this particular way? And people said, oh, that'll never happen. Yeah, anybody ever said that with software? Oh, that doesn't happen. Oh, that can't possibly happen. Yeah, fortunately, Margaret Hamilton thought we should do something in case it does, just on the off chance. And turns out she, she, she was right. That's, that's engineering. Okay? Um, but she coined this phrase. The other thing people think is, 
Okay, well, software engineer, yeah, this is often associated with the uh, software crisis. This is where the phrase the software crisis came from. It, there's maybe a whole two pages dedicated to it. It's that really not, it's a, it, to say that it's a, a minor sideshow of the paper, you know, possibly even overestimates its importance. So people kind of latched onto that. Read the thing, you discover all kinds of stuff. Really interesting, including this one. The design process is an iterative one. And Andy Kinsler wasn't the only person to say it. You go through the document, it's just like they're all saying, oh, you can't plan everything up front. Pretty much every, there's a diversity of opinion. Not everybody agrees with everybody else on everything. It's just like any group of people. But what's really interesting is that this one keeps being repeated. It's just like, oh, okay. Um, so you can't blame all the planning up front stuff on these guys, because that wasn't what they were saying. They were saying something quite different. So, they were in the, uh, the shadow of a really interesting book, Notes on the Synthesis of Form. Ah, yes, I said it right. Honestly, Notes on the Synthesis of Form is quite difficult to say. It's one of those book titles that you think only ever appeared on the page. Nobody ever actually spoke it out loud. That's why it's often referred to just simply as notes um, in, in abbreviation. This is Christopher Alexander. It was published in 1964. Um, this is my copy of it. Um, uh, it, was, it turns out it was a very influential book. Uh, he's the guy who's responsible for patterns. It predates his patterns work. And he's interested in architecture. That's his background. But the book is much deeper than that. He is much more interested in, exactly as he said, synthesis of form. How do we make things? How do we make things that are reasonable and, and, survive, and survive and sustainable? And he makes this observe, observation. We may therefore picture the process of form making as the action of a series of subsystems, all interlinked yet sufficiently free of one another to adjust independently in a feasible amount of time. So this is interesting because this gets quoted in the software engineering uh, proceedings. But it's also it's a general observation about how do, you build, how do you build big things? How do you build big complex things? You know, build them, don't, don't build them as monoliths, build them as subsystems. How do you get people working together? Same kind of thing. There needs to be grouping, but also a little bit of space. How do you organize your knowledge? And if we go back to code, this is knowledge. It's the same kind of idea of like, some things cluster, but keep them, uh, keep them at arm's length. Don't couple to things that you're not sure about. Put a little bit of separation in there so that you can change your mind, quite literally change your mind as you discover new things, as things change. And he sort of makes this a dynamic rather than static process. It works because the cycles of correction and recorrection, which occur during adaptation, are restricted to one subsystem at a time. It allows you to revise your knowledge. It allows you to learn. Yeah? Yeah, from this, we can also understand that not only our code base is inconsistent, but you might actually think your own mind is quite inconsistent, your own set of beliefs. Honestly, if you tried to compile a human mind, it probably wouldn't compile. You know? Okay? You know, it's just like, I remember one person complaining, oh, the web, you know, HTML, all of the web languages, they're all, they're, they're not statically typed. And I did make the observation, if you tried to compile the web, it wouldn't. It works because of exactly this. There's a little bit of give. There's a little bit of space for getting things wrong, but also for changing your mind. And in that exact same space, there's a space for imagination and getting things right. So, you know, it represents it nicely with this uh, diagram uh, visually. Now, there's this idea of, like, do we know the things that we are able to couple to? And be careful with those little assumptions, those shortcuts. You have to be on the guard. This is why sometimes you need a little bit more insight. You know, we can go back a, a few years, a couple of thousand years. I always like to think of this one. You know, you've got the first Roman programmer. Months seven, eight, nine, and 10 don't have names. What should we call them? Second Roman programmer. Ah, go on, just number them. There's always one person like that in the office. Ah, just ship it, man. <sighs> Roman programmer one. Isn't it bad practice to hard code numbers? Programmer two. Ah, it's fine, they'll never change. Right, September, October, November, December, it is then. If you've ever wondered why it is that months 9, 10, 11, 12 have the number 7, 8, 9, 10 embedded in them, or had ever even thought of it, it also shows a remarkable failure of imagination. Ah, we've run out of names. All right, just number them. Um, names matter. Names convey meaning, but also the things that you think are going to be the anchor points deserve a little bit of suspicion, especially if they are just numbers and placeholders. Yeah? Um, be aware of placeholder names. Um, so. Uh, so, so I live I live in Bristol, which is across the bridge from South Wales. Apparently, down here you've got a New South Wales. 
How, how new is New South Wales? I think it's quite old now, isn't it? I mean, by Australian standards. Um, okay, the first city you hit when you go across the bridge um, uh, from Bristol is Newport. That hasn't been new for centuries. <laughs> One of the universities my older son is considering at the moment is the University of Newcastle. That castle has not been new for a very, very long time. These placeholder names, you've got to watch out for them. They become these, these uh, they take on a life of their own. Um, so this gets us to, back to this idea that we have to watch out for um, the very words, the very pieces that we, uh, the very pieces of, of, of speech that we use with one another, but also put into the code. Um, in the uh, more theoretical book um, on patterns and pattern languages in the Poser series, uh, one of the topics that we dealt with um, was exactly this, meaning and relationship to patterns. And we had a little bit on semiotics, which I, I, I had great fun writing, but there's this simple idea of semiotics, as it were, meaning of signs, defines a sign as a two-part whole, a dyad comprising a signifier and a signified. The signifier is the expression of a sign, its material aspect. The signified is the corresponding mental concept engendered by the signifier. So let's talk about dinner briefly. So, uh, I had, so dinner, there, uh, you know, it's, it's got a fairly stable, it's got a fairly stable spelling, um, but its meaning is highly variable. And it's very, I'm, I'm from the south of England. Um, I had a girlfriend many years ago, who's from the north. And, uh, and she invited me around for dinner on Sunday. Um, so I turned up about six o'clock thinking I was early. And there was this cloud of studied yet angry silence that followed her around. I sensed something was not right. <laughs> and after a while, as we start eating, I say, oh, aren't your friends, aren't we waiting for your friends? Yes, they turned up five and a half hours ago. We yet. By the way, this is all before the era of mobile phones and stuff like that, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, and it's just like, oh, Sunday dinner is actually, a, is actually a lunchtime. Oh, okay, right. I mean, I won't say it was the end of the relationship, but it was kind of in the, the credits were about to roll. Um, <laughs> that, this did not help. So, you know, I was thinking maybe we're going to be an early or a, a late dinner. So, so here's an interesting piece of symbolism, half two. Now, half two is an interesting phrasing because depending on where you are, it has certain meanings. So, uh, you may be looking at it and go, oh, okay, so he's British, yeah, he'll be saying, yeah. You might be thinking, yeah, that's about that. But it turns out not everybody shares this. This is a very common interpretation. Um, in Danish, half two. In German, halb zwei. It turns out it's half before, not half after. You could turn up an hour wrong, which is certainly an improvement on my dinner situation, but there's a point there where whenever I use this phrase, I always have to highlight this to people who speak absolutely brilliant English as a second language, but are not familiar with the British idiom, because in America, given that the default language of software development is American English. It, this just doesn't turn up. And so therefore, they are unfamiliar with this um, uh, uh, sort of quirk. Um, but what I find interesting is whenever I use this and I ask people to tell me what it means, nobody ever suggests that or that. Now that's an interesting one because why would we not pick that time in the morning? Because that's equally valid. The reason we don't do it is because of our current context, we're awake. Well, I hope you are. I can't quite see all the way to the back. I can't hear any snoring, but, but this is a point. Your context, it turns out there's something else when it comes to semiotics. The original idea was a signifier and a signified. It turns out your context matters hugely. You change the context and suddenly the meaning of the thing changes hugely. It's not just a set of things, suddenly it resolves to one. If during the day I say half two, then that's a daytime. I don't, unless I've clarified, oh, after midnight, but I'd probably be more likely to say half two in the morning at that point, just to be sure. So in other words, there's the things we do not say because they come for free with the environment. And of course, if we use the expression half two in North America, it's unambiguously one. <laughs> um, so in other words, 
the symbols have a completely different meaning. It's arithmetic. Why is Kevlin halving two? What has that got to do with anything? Yeah. And so, but we have these other words where we have these default assumptions, and we go with one and ignore the, poss the other possibilities. So I want to talk about velocity. Oh, there's a word we use. We talk about development velocity. Honestly, I wish more teams would talk about velocity because my experience is most teams talk about speed, but they're using the word velocity. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a bit old school. Somewhere in my past, I have a degree in physics, and I just can't give, give up the whole idea that, you know, velocity, it's a vector. You've got direction. It turns out that really matters. Okay, I, 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 had, this experience, uh, I had this experience once driving on a, driving at, at great speed. It turns out I was uh, driving along. This is pre-GPS era. Driving along going like, yeah, I think I'm in the right direction. And I saw the sun in the wrong part of the sky. I, it turns out that I was not heading towards Germany. I was heading towards the North Sea, which was the wrong direction. Um, it, I would have been better off walking. It turns out that speed in the wrong direction is not what you're after. This is why I say it would be very helpful if teams figured out their velocity. The velocity, what is the direction we are going? Sometimes you can say, direction, what does that apply to? It applies to the quality of your code. Oh, yeah, we are just... We are just tearing through the feature list, and you're looking at the code, and tearing is right. <laughs> you know, it's just like this is a scene of devastation. And it's that notion of like, well, this technical debt is going to come back to bite you. You know? Oh, we're building the wrong thing brilliantly. That's also not a good thing. And there's this idea of understanding where you are heading. And there's kind of like the immediately in front of you and what, what's the traffic ahead and what's the general direction we're heading in. So we focus just on the magnitude. We get obsessed with the magnitude and therefore we are driven by the magnitude because it turns out magnitude is sometimes very easy to measure. Or is it? How, how do you measure? How do you measure speed? And it turns out, well, if I'm dealing with physical quantities, it's just like, ah, this is great. It's displacement of space. That's perfect. You know, this is how much space per time. Uh, let's simplify it to the kind of SUVAT that my younger son is learning. Space per time. Hmm, that's interesting. Turns out there's a few things missing here. We'll come back to this one. But there's this idea of the meaning of that. What is S? In software, S is, well, let's use a technical term, stuff. It's stuff per time. And here's the question, what is that stuff? And th this is the problem. We then wander around and look for the thing that we can measure. You know, it's just, oh, we, we need precise, yeah, we need precise measurement of what? I don't know, what can you find? Uh, lines of code, story points, uh, all, all of these things. And they then form a secondary, they form an economy. They form a currency and there's inflation and all kinds of crazy stuff. It, but one thing that we are actually not measuring is we haven't got a real grasp on is what progress are we making? It turns out it's an approximate thing. It's like trying to estimate your walking speed when you've got no bearings. You can generally sense fast or slow, but if somebody says, well, I'm kind of debating here, are we walking at, you know, are we, are we walking at 4.2 kilometers per hour or 4.3? Honestly, it's going to be somewhere between three and five, you know? And I think we're probably walking at a fairly, uh, we're walking at a reasonable pace, so a little bit above four, and because it's flat terrain, so I'm going to make that guess. But sometimes our quest for precision makes us look for the thing that is not there. You know, we end up measuring the thing that is not useful. Yeah, and it's at that point that somebody says, yeah, we've been making excellent progress at 4.3 kilometers per hour for the last 52 minutes. It turns out we should have been going in that direction. That precision is not going to help you unless you're roughly in the right direction. And then we come to this question of, of inter determining meaning by the things that are missing. Okay, so first of all, we need to look at the words and their set of possibilities, recognize those. And this is a gloriously self-referential sentence where its whole meaning is conveyed by the absence of something. And here is a blank screen. Now, if I put the word blank in it, it ceases to be a blank screen. So sometimes the very act of pointing to something sort of changes it. Changes it. The, at a broad level, the act of entering a market changes that market. And your assumptions about what it will be in 12 months' time are, there's a word we use, fiction. 
The same also goes, by the way, when you're trying to debug something. So that bug was there a minute ago. Damn it, what's it doing? Where's it gone? I'm not making this up, it was there. So again, we come back to the words. Because the words are interesting and they're funny, they have history, they change with time. Where's, where's the word blank come from? It comes from the word French, blanc, which means white. So that's perfectly serviceable blank screen, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 but it's the wrong colour. By the way, this is called etymological fallacy. If you ever have one of those debates where somebody says, oh, this word always meant this, you can't use that word in this way. Honestly, half the English language is, <laughs> half the English language is standing there going, oh, don't look at me. <laughs> and then we look at red. Now, this is interesting because here we have a colour that is filled with possibilities and meaning. Okay, red means danger. Red means celebration. Okay, you move, it depends where you are in the world and the time, how people associate that. And, and how can you, you know, you, it turns out that you have these interpretations, red means stop. All of these things, but until I've given you a bit more of a hint, ah, right, I'm gonna give you some more context. So, but then it turns out the meaning of things can be changed through the smallest thing. This is like software, I, I love this. In Bristol, Bristol gets quite creative, street art and graffiti. Um, do not cross the red man. You know, it's just, well, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna mess with him. Um, the threat is sufficient. But what we've done there is we've taken a system of meaning, uh, road signs, we've taken a system of meaning, and what it took was to change one symbol and you subverted it. This is true of software. You can change the meaning how a piece of code works through the simplest of changes. Everything else seems to fit together. You just change one thing and no, it no longer means the same thing. It no longer has the same effect. This is one of the places where bugs happen. This is one of the places where dead code that comes back to life because you forgot to delete it and the condition that could never ever happen happens. And then suddenly the new code or rather the new behavior is running against code that is five years old. The world has moved on. You know, it's one of those things that I observed with a team. I said, you know, we're, when they were talking about commented out code, we were looking at their commented out code, and I said, what do you think would happen, you know, what do you think would happen if you uncommented this code? So I'm looking, looking at it, it's just like, when, when was this code commented out? About five years, why, five years ago. Why, do you, why didn't you guys get rid of it? It's like, oh, well, you never know, we might need it. It's like, no, really, I do know. <laughs> Have you ever uncommented a piece of code? The team looks at it itself, and it's just like, well, that's not actually ever happened. But that's not to say it could never happen. This is true. This is true. But I said, what will happen if you uncomment it? And one of the guys said, well, it won't compile. And I said, well, how useful is that? And I said, but what's the worst thing that could happen? Silence. I said, it would compile. That is the worst thing because you've now got something that gives the illusion that it works. But this is systems that we create are very delicate. You can subvert their meaning very, very simply. I love this. That was a, you know, no part. Oh, yeah. All it took was something, just a little sign, and suddenly the whole meaning has become a little menacing. <laughs> so we have these little systems. We have red. We talk about red meaning stop, green meaning go. But we're also assuming, even if we clarify what we think are the conventions, if I put red and green together, you're thinking, oh, okay, stop and go, as opposed to any of the other interpretations of red. It's not, it's not red is danger in this case. It's not red is celebration. We are now talking, okay, this is fine. But there's something else we've overlooked, and it goes back to this idea of the things that are not there. They're not there for all of us, but for some of us they are or are not. So, my wife and I went to this art installation in Bristol last summer. Um, and uh, you can tell by the grey sky, that's British summer. Um, uh, it's not filled with rain. That's, that's kind of how you know, kind of. Um, and she chuckled as she came around the corner. She said, Kevin, can you see what that says? And I said, no, I, I think there's something, something on there. I'm red, green, colour blind. And so I'm looking at it going, it's just like, yeah, but I'm also a technologist. Just a moment, let me get my camera out. <laughs> Switch to black and white, thank you very much. Is this red? Oh, very funny. So, you know, this is, there's a small percentage of people going, yeah, 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 thank you. The joke's at my expense, art. You call that art? But here's a point. What we've got here is a reminder, and this is wired into my physiology, but it's also wired into other people's experiences and their context, 
that sometimes they will not see the thing that is right there in front of them. They're not tuned to it. They, they simply cannot see. They, they are not interpreting through the right paradigm. They're not expecting that. And that's that sometimes, at least in software, we can normally address this through a matter of education. But there's this idea, you can have an intelligent people working with incomplete knowledge with very good learning skills and they still can't see something. Even when it's pointed out, they don't recognize its significance. You point it out and they don't recognize how important that assumption or that idea was. And this tells us that sometimes we'll never understand what other people are saying. We must understand there is a limit to knowledge. So this is a test that is sometimes used for synesthesia. Um, uh, number grapheme uh, synesthesia, which I also have, it turns out, um, uh, which is where digits get associated with colors. So um, I, it's quite easy to distinguish the twos and fives because um, they, they've chosen the wrong colors, I will say, for this test. They've tried to say, this is how a synesthetic would see it. It's like, not quite. Um, synesthetics tend to have different choices of colors. It turns out my colors for two and five are green and red, ironically enough. Um, I don't have a problem with that, because it's in my head, yeah? But there's a point here, you cannot have that experience unless you have it. So there's this idea of shared experience, but turns out we cannot have everybody share all of our experiences. There will always be something. We, we have to acknowledge there's gonna be a gap. We have all these different frames of reference. We talk about trees, and where we have bedded down a word to the point that when we talk to somebody else, we have forgotten our own assumptions. In software development, we have trees all over the place, except for some reason, they're upside down. Um, and the, this is not simply a local adjustment for being in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> oh yeah, in case you're wondering, this is good weather in Bristol. Um, uh, this is, uh, no, no effects are applied to this photo. This is the beginning of January last year. That's where I run. It's a great place to run in fog because nobody else can see you. you know? so, um, but, and then we go around and we say, yeah. So, but these trees, we don't think of them as green. We think of them as red and black. Um, yeah, and that's called the Stroop effect. Trying to read out the color of a word that represents a different color. This is the, the uh, original cover of the um, uh, Agile uh, development with Scrum book. Um, and it's this, the Stroop effect is it's confounding in many ways, but what you're getting is two sets of symbols, two sets of meaning. And again, we get that with code. We are working with so many different systems of meaning. If you walk into an office and you see there are pieces of code, there are bits, and you've got people that working on UI, you've got stickies here and there, You've got all these different systems of meaning, and some of them are in violent contradiction with one another. Um, and we're the people that hold it together, because humans can handle contradiction up to a point. But I'm switching to Scrum, because I want to talk about another word. I want to talk about the word value. Because people often go, oh yeah, we're developing business, we're developing value. That's what we're doing. You ask for clarification, because what kind of value are you talking about? Because there's personal value, there's um, emotional value, there's business value. Oh, okay. And why do we use the phrase business value? Because often people want to prioritize, or even prioritize, by business value. And people talk about, we're going to prioritize the backlog by business value. I'm always fascinated by this because it turns out that's actually not possible. And words matter. There are some words missing from this phrasing. You cannot prioritize by business value unless you have a time machine. <laughs> Conveniently, I have one. <laughs> the rest of you, not so lucky. You have to break the laws of physics to prioritize by business value because it turns out you don't know the value of a feature. You can only prioritize by estimated business value. That's the best you can do. The business value is an estimation and therefore, as such, it has error bars on it. It has a certain air of uncertainty and it's also something that should be looked at later but rarely is. People often present business value as an end of a conversation because I'm the product owner, I know the business. No, you don't. Because if you knew the business value, if you had this insight, you've either got a time machine or you're ridiculously wealthy because you've been lucky all the time. You don't have these. And it's not a criticism of them. It turns out they're human as well. There's this idea, just that extra word, estimated. Oh, it puts a little bit of caution into us. Just uh, don't, don't, don't over egg what you think you know. So in our pursuit of value, we do have to be a little bit careful. This is one of my favorite cartoons on this. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. 
Um, and this idea is to try and understand. So I'm going to kind of sort of on the home stretch, I want to start looking at this idea of context and our frames of looking at things. I'm going to go back to um, Maya Manny Lehman, same paper. And he gave us a system of classification, three kinds of programs, three kinds of code, three kinds of software system, S, P, and E. S programs, programs whose function is formally defined by and derivable from specification. Okay, so lots of things that are easily unit testable fall into this. If I give you a problem and you say, oh yeah, I can imagine the test for that, there's a very good chance that it's an S problem. It's an S program you're dealing with. A lot of the classic um, computer science lab rat stuff like sorting, that falls into this. If I give you the rules of banking and I say this is how accounts work, then those work like that. They are S programs. The, we can be very confident about these. They are, we, want to, we want to build lots of our bigger systems. We'd like them to be made, made out of S parts because we can be very sure about them. Yeah, they, they, they satisfy that, but we can also, when somebody tells you what they want, doesn't mean you know what the code is, you can have an idea. Yeah, I think I know how I go about starting this. Then we get P programs. The problem to be solved can be precisely defined, but the acceptability of a solution is determined by the environment in which it is embedded. In other words, acceptability is an interesting criteria. Now, this is a really interesting one because this is a growing, this was 1980. If you look at a lot of machine learning stuff, it falls into this, because you don't have an exact answer, you have, an accept, you have to define what do we think is acceptable here? And if we start treating these as if they were these, well, we end up with all kind of nonsense that, we, that generally makes the news. What, is our, what are our acceptability criteria? Yeah. Sometimes this also applies to engineering. It applies to you know, meteorology. Turns out, this is another revelation, the real world does not use floating point numbers. It turns out that the atmosphere does not move in cells that are thousands of meters wide that are represented by floating point numbers. It's a little more continuous than that. So therefore, you're always dealing, when you're doing weather forecasting, no matter how much computing power you are throwing at it, you are always approximating. What are your acceptable bounds? So there is this idea. P programs are a little harder. They're a little harder to test. Their algorithms are not necessarily as obvious. You cannot derive them as easily. If somebody says, you withdraw money from a bank account, I can pretty much tell there's going to be some subtraction somewhere, and I've got a very good idea of that, and I can tell what's going to be uh, in the audit. But this gets a little harder. But the really interesting category is this one. Programs that mechanize a human or societal activity. The program has become a part of the world it models. It is embedded in it. Now, this is really interesting because we get so used to S thinking, we get a little bit bamboozled by P thinking, which is why these things, machine learning uh, horror stories about biases and inappropriate biases based on data tend to make the news. We are utterly shocked by this stuff. It surprises us every single bloody time. We should have learned, but here we go. This is interesting because what it is, is actually an exercise in meaning of systems. So this goes back to 2011. <laughs> the making of a fly, the genetics of animal design. A pat and I spoke to a geneticist recently. I, I used this example uh, in a place and one guy I knew had done genetics and I said, I said you know, is this, is this legit? Because um, I'd heard it was a standard reference book. He said, yeah, absolutely, standard reference book. But I wouldn't pay that price for it. <laughs> you know, it, or I, I'd buy it used for $35. You know? <laughs> that price tag of around two million is, ooh, possibly a little high. Um, now, what is interesting is this isn't actually, this is Amazon as a, a marketplace rather than Amazon as a book vendor. So you've got Prof Nath and Bordy book. And the, the guy who wrote this blog, he made this observation. He says, oh, this is, how, how do you get to this? So he made some observations over successive days. There are some ratios here that are startlingly stable. It turns out there's only two players in the market. They're both automated, and both of their systems are operating correctly for their understanding of how markets work. They have a system of meaning. We understand this model of economics. What is the model of economics? Profnath has the book. What is their strategy? Our strategy is we undercut the lowest other price in the market. We will always be the cheapest. Board ebook do not have the book. Their strategy is you buy it from us, we'll buy it from them, get a nice little markup, pass it on to you. 
their system is also correct. However, they do not have a system of interpretation or meaning feedback. So you get a different kind of feedback. The humans are, we feed back on meaning. Wait a minute, that's not, what, that's not right. We go after a while. How long did this take? Oh, <laughs> they broke the $20 million <laughs> barrier <laughs> before somebody pulled the plug on it and realized. So this is a really, so what's interesting here is what you've got is two systems independently operating correctly within the limits of the understanding of what it means for us to do business in this market. But you put these things together and things happen. Now we might say, well, you know, yeah, Amazon solved that. Oh, it's not a big deal. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about Brexit. I've held back. <laughs> Honestly, what nonsense. <laughs> Yeah, the, the pound has been having a really exciting visit, and you know I sometimes put it as you know Britain's currently undergoing a social experiment. Honestly, it's, do not replicate this experiment at home. <laughs> do not do this. It's not going very well, um, and it never passed an ethics board. Let's be very clear. But the pound took a hell of a beating in 2016, and it's pretty much flatlined ever since. It's kind of looking looking at the end of this month, going like, yeah, you have seen nothing yet. Um, but that is quite an impressive drop. That's a drop of around 10% of value in a really short period of time. Faster than humans can do. Because humans weren't involved. This is the joy of algorithmic trading. We're gonna do the wrong thing at speed. It's optimized to do it wrong. Well, that's not the optimization. Again, you've got exactly the situation that played out with Profnath and Bordy Books. But it's now a little more mysterious. We don't know who was, quite, who was involved, but it, basically it triggered all the other algorithmic trading systems which were independently working in their own correct way. And that caused this uh, flash crash. We're gonna see a lot more of this kind of stuff. And this is where what we're doing is we are taking systems, small universes of what people understand. You may remember the original um, uh, layman quote from the beginning of some portion of the universe some world of discourse or portion of the universe, that's what we're talking about. And that little, that little system is a system of meaning. Now the problem is, when it comes into contact with another system of meaning, if it doesn't recognize, oh, you're different, we need to have, probably have a little bit of a handshake or you know, a little bit of doubt, actually, hesitation and doubt, a pause, some consideration, we're gonna end up with a lot more of this. So there's a book on real architecture, lovely book. Um, uh, quote, quote of the Finnish architect Elil Saarinen, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. And that idea, that idea gives us something that is quite valuable. Um, an observation I made a couple of uh, years ago, I, I'm often very skeptical of when people talk about being full stack developers. It's kind of normally they mean a little bit of JavaScript in the middle um, and it touches the database and it does a bit on the UI. It's just, yeah, honestly, there's a lot more of the stack. It goes, oh, it's turtles all the way down. But it's not just downward looking. There's an upward bit. There's the outside world. It turns out there's sloppy human stuff on the outside. And it's not just individuals here. I'm talking about societal stuff and other systems which we were not involved in, which are their own systems of meaning. Um, and so, Next time we hear, it's just semantics. That's not a dismissal. We need to recognize that for what it is. It is a, it's an invitation. It's a beginning. It is not an end. That's the whole point of what we do. Thank you very much. <laughs>